Well, thank you. Um, hello, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to um, speak to you this evening. I've got to say, I wasn't nervous until I stood here in front of you. I've done this a few times. I don't really get very nervous, but I'm guessing maybe there's a techie crowd, and I'm not talking about technology at all. Um, that's why I'm nervous. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. It only lasts half an hour, so don't worry too much. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm really excited to be here because at last uh, I'm on the agenda, which um, about time we got around to that. I don't mean me personally. What I mean is that we're talking about the people part of the people processes and tools triumvirate, right? 30 years in technology, we've spent most of that time talking about technology, a lot of technology. When we're not talking about technology, we're talking about the methodology, right? When we all know it's the people that unlock the value. Problem is the people is a really difficult bit, okay? So we just leave it alone and we say agile thinking's important, lean thinking's important. We don't really talk about what it is. An agile mindset, really important, gotta have one of those. Anybody know what it is? Oh, no, I'm not sure. Right, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> already. Uh, my name is John Turley, as Matt said, I work for Adaptivist. Um, for almost uh, 30 years, I have been in IT. I've, been, I've led PMOs and project management and program management and so on and so on and so on and so on. I've done lots and lots of big programs, many millions of pounds, blah, blah, blah. Worked for UBS and Thomas Cook. I was employed by them consuming um, services from the likes of IBM and Infosys and Vodafone and so on. Most of my time has been spent working for the likes of IBM and Infosys and not Vodafone, providing services to those clients. And it was brilliant in parts, but in 2017, uh, I gave up. I threw my toys out the pram completely. I'd had enough. So despondent and disheartened with the state of the industry. So disheartened with the fact that despite the magic that we could produce, that we could do with teams when we got it right, when we integrated an agile approach and a waterfall approach, let's say, the people that control the purse strings, still didn't want to change things. So I thought, I've had enough. I'm going to retrain as something else. And as I started to think about what I was going to retrain as, <laughs> can't see a clock, what I was going to retrain as, I realized that there were lots and lots of questions I had about what I'd been doing that I couldn't answer. Why did what I was doing work when other people were failing? Would it always work? What was special about the circumstances in, in which it worked that meant it? I didn't know the answer to these things. And I, and I was curious. I wanted the answer. And it's finding those answers that took me into complexity theory and some research with De Montfort University, um, developmental uh, psychology and sociology. And it's those two things that I bring, with you, uh, bring uh, an offer to you today, really. It's nearly 30 years of experience building stuff but also looking at that world through a different lens of complexity and psychology to try and help us understand how we do the difficult bit, how we do the, um, the people bit. Uh, so, that's essentially what we're going to cover, okay? We're going to try and answer three questions. What is an agile mindset? Well, an agile mindset is the heart of deep collaboration, and we need collaboration like we've never needed collaboration before. We need innovation too, by the way, but without collaboration, we can't really get to innovation. Um, uh, what is it? What, what is this agile mindset, this mysterious thing called agile mindset? Well, I couldn't find anything in the agile of the IT community that would help me with that, right? Don't stop on my account. You carry on. You suddenly look really guilty. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> good, good. Um, uh, so we turn to the world of psychology, right? Developmental psychology, and we, look, we can learn a lot from them about how we make sense of the world around us. Um, and how do we get one? So it turns out the same developmental psychologist that can help us understand what the mindset is also, guess what, in their clinical work, look at how psychology develops, under what circumstances it develops. And when we start to understand that, we can start to understand how we can create an environment in which people might choose to go on a journey of psychological growth. They might not, too. You might, you might not, and that's fine. You don't have to, right? We don't have to start collaborating more. We don't have to adopt an agile mindset because it actually is quite uncomfortable. Anyway, they're the questions that we are going to be answering. So first, why is an agile mindset um, important? Right, I want to stand over here in front of you, but I can't press the button, so I'll 
I don't know where to stand. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I don't know when I'm going to press it either. So I'll just move around. Thank you. Um, so why, why are we talking more about an agile mindset and more about collaboration than we've done previously? Well, the quick answer to that, and I think many of you are going to be familiar with it, so I'm going to try and rush through it, is that complexity is increasing. Okay? Complexity is increasing as a result of globalization and powerful technology um, and scale. Okay? Now, what do we mean by complexity? Well, it's quite, quite simple to define, really. A complex environment, and I deliberately don't say system for reasons I probably won't get to, a complex working environment is one that has many, many moving parts. And those moving parts, <laughs> those moving parts, are, um, yeah, uh, are, are all interconnected, okay? And what, what that means is, getting over the fart gag, what that, what that means is that, that that high degree of interconnectivity means that uh, complex environments are volatile and they're ambiguous and they're unpredictable, okay? Now, that's a little bit academic, so I'm going to ask you to think about your own environment, the environments in which you work. When I think about the environment in which I work, I can see that it's got more complex. It feels like over the last couple of years, big time, but really <coughs> through the entire 30 years of my career. So outsourcing is a great example. I've worked for a lot of outsource, uh, outsourcing providers, and I've worked for a lot of companies that outsource services to them, right? And think about what has happened in those organizations. Once upon a time, at the beginning of my career, large companies had an IT department. We might all work in the IT department, right? And if we wanted to get something done, I'd walk over and talk to Paul and we'd get something done. Now, Paul and I might already have a relationship. We might have known each other for a while because people like to stay in their jobs for a while, right? <laughs> we work for the same em employer, so, so we have that in common at least, right? Maybe uh, we have similar objectives. Certainly the company has a strategy, so we respond to that, right? There's also a social relationship. Me and Paul want to work together in the future, and we, we want to have a working relationship that works for us, not one that's uncomfortable. We're invested in that, okay? Now, as soon as we outsource whatever I do, so Paul stays in the company, and I'm, I'm now, I now get two pit off to IBM, and I work for um, IBM, providing the same services, right? Things have already got more complex, because now in between me and Paul, we don't have a uh, social relationship anymore. We have a commercial relationship, okay? It's governed by contracts and service catalogs and change control processes and so on and so on and so on, okay? So we've got to think about that. Um, the um, complexity increases because um, there's not just one outsourcing provider, right? It's probably multiple. So Paul's company has multiple outsourcing providers. So now Paul has to interact with three companies all through commercial relationships. And those companies, of course, don't talk to each other. So what nobody saw coming is that Paul needs to be the conduit for all the communication information so that one provider who looks after the network and another looks after the data center, another looks after the end user. This is more complex, okay? In fact, it gets more complex as soon as we introduce more I looked look at you like that was your fault. It was my fault. I, I didn't mean it was. As soon as we introduce more people, things get complex. So actually, this dichotomy between the complicated world and the complex world doesn't really stand up to much scrutiny, but it's a useful framework to help us think, right? Um, wherever we've got more than two people, some complexity theorists say you've got a complex system, mm -hmm. okay? Reasonable way of looking at it. So we're all experiencing complexity. And in that environment that I just described to you, the one where Paul's company now has three outsourcing providers, things are more volatile, right? That is, they'll move from one extreme to the other quickly. So the whole network goes down or nothing happens. They're both extremes. Right? It's unpredictable because God only knows how the process is actually supposed to work. And never mind the process that's supposed to get information moving between suppliers. Okay, so actually getting anything done, when the stuff might happen, God only knows, right? So it's unpredictable. Now, the world hasn't always been this way, right? Um, the world for hundreds and hundreds of years, particularly in Western culture, we've thought of as being complicated. We thought of it being a machine. Newton thought that if you knew the mass and the force of anything in the universe, you could, you could predict everything, right? The world was a clockwork machine. That was his view, and it embedded... Yeah, 
it embedded deeply in our way of thinking. You can see it in um, Taylor's scientific management. You can see it in Alfred Sloan's study for General Motors in which in 1921 he said the optimum way to organize a company was hierarchically and bureaucratically. And newsflash for you guys, it was. Right? Hierarchy and bureaucracy and process are not dirty words. They're not to be thrown away by agile, right? Um, they are very, very necessary. They've listed, lifted billions of people out of poverty. I'd be working in a potato field right now if it wasn't for hierarchy and bureaucracy, because I'm from Lincolnshire and that's all that happened. <laughs> that's all that happened in Lincolnshire. That's why I said potato field. But and now, and I'm not saying that all the world is becoming complex in some sort of homogenous way. It's not. But the pockets of complexity are increasing. They're becoming more numerous. And those pockets of complexity are also getting bigger. So more of us find ourselves working in complex environments. Now that creates a challenge for our way of thinking. Because there's a, the sociologists can show is that there's a very strong relationship between the mindset that we develop, the psychology that we develop, and the environment that we exist in. Okay, so if we exist in an environment that is largely stable and predictable, because most things are known or knowable, we develop a mindset to, to, to match that. Why wouldn't we? Why would we go any further, right? Because that mindset can explain the way things work. And there's some research out there, some very convincing research from William Torbert and Bob Keegan that shows most people have, have got a mindset that's suited to that, uh, uh, that stable environment. Okay, trust me, I could... Sorry? Yeah, 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 because they develop recursively. So the environment that we're working in changes very, very quickly. A hierarchical bureaucratic way of working does not, right? You can't get the messages, to, you know why it doesn't work, right? You can't get the messages up and down the hierarchy quick enough. So, so we've got to do something else, right? Because we've got a problem. There's a mismatch between the environmental complexity and our psychological complexity. And that mismatch drives a lot of anxiety for people. I watch it. We play with it, actually. We deliberately create it, which sounds really mean, doesn't it? But I'll tell you, about, I'll tell you why uh, later. But we can't solve those problems by thinking, about, thinking in the way that created them. So taking an operational mindset, if you will, by which I mean the opposite to an agile mindset, and trying to solve these problems of complexity, that creates problems, right? That creates pro so we need a new way of thinking. So... What is it? When did I start? About, about 10 past? It's not that I need to finish on time. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm talking too fast. Am I talking too fast? No? Are you all right? All right. So, so what is an agile mindset? So we learn a lot from developmental psychologists. The dominant view of psychology is that of cognitive psychology, right? Cognitive psychology has it that your brains are organic computers. And the organic computer gets its input through your five senses, right? And it uh, computes data and it produces a predictable outcome if it's working properly. Okay? Now, that sounds totally implausible, I think, if I say it out loud. It sounds ridiculous. Surely we don't think everything, things are that simple, right? But every time you've spoken to somebody, and you've explained something and they've not got it, so you've explained it again. Every time you get to the point, maybe the third or fourth or the fifth time, where you get frustrated, they still don't get it. They still don't get it. What's wrong with them, right? That's you or me, because I think we all do it, operating from the assumptions that are based around cognitive psychology. What you're actually thinking is, well, I've tried to change the input in so many different ways now. The input must have been right. It can only be a malfunction in the organic computer, right? Okay, so this, this actually isn't very helpful because what it introduces is the idea that I'm now right because I've tried providing the input differently numerous times and I've practiced. You must be wrong. Or, you know, not you, Paul, but whoever you're talking to, right? So then, so then you're into this sort of dichotomy between right and wrong. Right, and how many meetings are you sat in where people are arguing the best way to do something? Who's right and who's wrong? And, oh my God, give it up, you know? The other problem with the cognitive view of psychology is because there's an implicit assumption that because our brains, there are no more structural changes to our brains after our early mid-20s when we, when we stop physically developing, right? 
I'm going to say fact. MRI scanners are so sophisticated these days, that would appear to be something we can say we know, right? So your cognitive function doesn't change, right? Because your brain has finished developing. Therefore, you become a fixed type, okay? And again, how many times have you heard somebody say, I'm the type of person who can deal with ambiguity and risk. I'm fine. Oh, I'm the type of person who likes it to be much more stable. I don't like surprises, right? That kind of stuff. Um, we're, we're, we've become a fixed type. Now, there's an alternative to this dominant view of psychology, which is called the constructivist school of psychology, right? Constructivist just means that uh, we are all constructing our own reality, right? That's where the word comes from. Over here, I've put sense making, right? We're all, we've probably, you've probably, who's heard of, this is a phrase that gets used a lot, right? Sense making, something in a meeting somebody used with me today. Dave Snowden has really popularized the idea with his Kinevan framework and that kind of thing. And the idea is, as it says up there, that we're all constructing our own reality all of the time, okay? So we're all creating in our own imagination a narrative that explains who we are, what our identity is, what your identity is, who you are, how the world works, what we're doing here, and so on and so on and so on. And it's that sense-making capability that the constructivists say operates over and above the cognitive capability. Now this opens up an intriguing possibility, the possibility of development beyond physical development. So the constructivists will say that um, uh, your psychology potentially at least can keep developing until the end of your life, right? It also goes into under what circumstances uh, it might develop, okay? And it's really very helpful when it comes to things like, for instance, dealing with conflict. Because conflict in a constructivist, from a constructivist position, isn't a question of right or wrong, it's a question of a mismatch in your sense-making capability. Okay, now that's a much more positive place to come from to try and re resolve um, conflict. Now what the psychologists also tell us is that we move through discernible psychological stages. Now this is a framework, and we know frameworks aren't ideal in lots of ways. We don't really move through discernible stages, right? But it's useful to think of them this way. And both Torber and Keegan's frameworks have got five stages. There are a number of intermediate stages, so I think it's 21 stages in Keegan's framework altogether, right? And they have names. They're referred to by numbers mostly by the psychologists. That's three, four, and five up there, okay? Now, this stage, most of us have reached by post-adolescence, okay? A self-authored stage, many people reach normally late 30s, early 40s, something like that, okay? And essentially, we can think about these two as being operational mindsets. They are mindsets that are constructed in an environment that is perceived to be predictable and stable, in which things are known or knowable, okay? This mindset, stage five, self-transforming, is very different. It's a very different mindset, and it really doesn't make sense for me to talk about them uh, a lot here, which is why I'm not. This, however, we can think of more like an agile mindset, right? Now, according to Keegan and Torbett's studies, which are of uh, 350 or 500 people, 497 people, depending on which one we're looking at, less than 1% of people have got a fully stage five or self-transforming mindset, right? But seven or 8% are on the transition between stage four, self-authored, and this. So what we're talking about with an Agile mindset is shifting from these, which are common, towards this, which is less common. Is that like an Alan Turing person, which just changes the way the world looks Yeah. Y yes. Yes. I mean, I didn't, I didn't assess him, <laughs> so I don't know, but I would imagine so, yeah. You can just start to do things with a stage mindset that you couldn't do. Right, Neo, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, I did this the other day and some feedback I got from one of the guys is this is really cliched. Every meetup they ever go to has got a Matrix reference in it, so I'm really sorry about the cliche. But what does an Agile mindset allow us to do, to your point? Well, in baseball, batters talk about seeing the ball come more slowly, right? I've never heard that used in cricket, but you, I mean, I imagine it's pretty much the same thing. And you kind of get what it means, right? Some of you in here, this has happened to me, might have fallen over and the world's kind of gone in slow motion, right? So what, 
A self-transforming mindset is a mindset that has a, has a more granular level of understanding about the reality that is around us, okay? And it allows you to literally see the world differently, okay? And I can give you some examples later. Oh, they come later. Um, so it allows you to see the world differently. Because you see the world differently, it allows you to see a different set of possible responses to the situation that you find yourself in, right? So, for example, seeing conflict differently in the way I've described it from a stage five mindset, from um, a constructivist point of view, rather than a cognitive point of view, seeing as it being a difference in the sense-making capability, that's the kind of difference you might get when you start to unlock an agile mindset. So, how do we develop one? And particularly, that's all quite theoretical, actually. Maybe even a bit dull. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe even a bit dull, right? We're doing, we've got to make that real because fine, John, fine, interesting. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But we've got to make it real, right? We've got to do something to unlock with that information. Otherwise, what's the point? So how do we develop an agile mindset? Well, we're doing lots of work in Adaptivist, which is having a very fundamental change on what our organization is. So this bit of the... Um, presentation is the interesting bit. Um, what we're doing is creating a deliberately developmental environment. It's a phrase that we've nicked from somebody else, I've nicked from somebody else, from a guy called Michael Hammond who's worth looking up. Um, all we mean by deliberately developmental environment is an environment where we're not just focused on the outcome that we want, solving a business problem, whatever that might mean. We're also interested in how do we get to that outcome? And how we behave is predetermined by how we think. So we're paying at least as much attention to how we create an environment in which people can challenge their own thinking as we are to getting the outcomes. Okay? So that's a deliberately developmental environment. I'll tell you more about that um, shortly. So a deliberately developmental environment needs to have four key characteristics. Right? This again comes from the uh, developmental psychologists, not from me. The first is that we need to have a complex problem. That sounds a little bit like a garbage phrase. What does it mean? Well, a complex problem might be one that you need multiple people to look at to even start to understand what the problem is, right? If you or any other person can look at, a pro uh, at the problem and you get it, it's not complex, okay? If you need to get other people to give you their perspective and somehow you need to merge your perspectives to grasp the problem, then it's complex. So there's an interpersonal nature to solving a complex problem. It's got to be relevant to your daily role or salient, right? You'll find this in Michael Hammond's book called Evolve Agility, really worth looking up if you're interested. Um, it's got to be relevant to your daily work. It's got to be salient, right? So sending you off raft building, waste of time. That could be a complex problem, but nobody cares, right? So it's not actually, it's not, it's not going to do anything. But keeping my, having a, a, a clean desk policy is relevant to my daily work, right? I mean, it would be nice to find things on my desk. Um, but it's not very uh, emotionally engaging. So we have to have things that are meaningful, that are emotionally engaging, that we care about, okay? Um, so important business problems relevant to your daily work that are complex and the, I can't read, somebody told me I ought to take this word down here on the left off and I can't because I like it so much. Disequilibrating. Disequilibrating, that's right. A better, a better way of putting it is we've got to get people out of their comfort zone, all right? Discombobulating. We've got to make things uncomfortable. If they're not uncomfortable, then you're not going to consider looking at the world in another way, right? But. We don't want people too far out their comfort zone. Too far out your comfort zone is nervous <laughs> breakdown inducing. We don't want to be too long uh, out your comfort zone for the same reason. And when people are outside their comfort zone, they need support. They need help and support. Okay? So one way of getting people out of their comfort zone, it's a good thing. This is, this is why we deliberately make people uncomfortable, is a lot of people will view Matt and I and our other colleague, John Kern, has been um, rabble-rousers or troublemakers or chaos-mongers or something like that, particularly when we're in the operational core of the business. And you can actually watch their anxiety levels go up as they start to say, well, I want a regular meeting and I want to have some milestones and a plan, and we go, yeah, no. And in, in the end, they'll blow their top, you know? And we use Zoom, right, like Skype. Zoom fires up, so I want to talk to you. And you're like, great, good, let's have a, let's have a chat. I'm really uncomfortable with the way you're working. 
I know. Why? Yeah. Now let's talk about it. And when we can have a talk about it in this context, that's providing them with support to challenge their operational view of the world, right? Not to dismiss it and say it's rubbish. We can't do that because it's important. It's that view of the world has lifted people out of poverty. So they're the four things that we need to get to, okay? Now, these are three things that we've done in Adaptive sort of tools to apply these techniques to create those, uh, create those conditions. One of the things that we've recognized is that the lateral interactions in an organization are really, really important. No surprise here, right? We all know that work really gets done depending on who we know and who we've got relationships with and when do we choose to get up from our desk and walk over and talk to somebody. Work doesn't get really, really get done because it fires down the hierarchy and back up, but some work does, right? And we get tasks allocated in JIRA bleh, or whatever, right? <laughs> so those lateral interactions are really important. Your success in your roles is probably a better indicator of your likely success in your roles is who do you know and who are you working with than which team are you in, right? But there's more to the social networks, right? The social networks aren't just about an individual's relationships with other individuals. If we map them right across a whole organization, we can start to see the structure of the social networks. Okay? And in that structure, we can, which we can do based on survey data, or we can suck data from Slack or JIRA or Confluence or any other source, right? What we can start to see in the structure of those networks are some remarkable things that were probably hidden to some people. We can start to see those who are on the periphery of the network who aren't engaged, who just don't have many contacts. There isn't much information flowing through them. They're likely to be bored. They're not really contributing as much as they might. They may be at risk of leaving if they've only been in for less than 12 months. We can see the opposite. We can see those people who are on the path to everything, right? They are gold, but they're also locking up knowledge and their bottlenecks on the flow of information through the value stream, right? So we can identify those. We can see silos clearly. And we can see the people who are naturally choosing to bridge the silos already. They're probably, unre all this is probably unrecognized, right? There's even a strong relationship between the structure of the social networks that are your organization, whatever, wherever you want to put the boundaries around that, and uh, emergent innovation. We can see where ideas come from. We, we can see where ideas are developed. We can see structures of network that are likely to be resistant to change and those that are likely to be open to change. This is like an X-ray into the way your organization really works and it's powerful and we, we learned a lot from it. We work with individuals to help them figure out how to develop a more agile mindset. Okay, so it doesn't really matter whether, you're, whether you have a co-authored, self-authored, or self-transforming mindset. Who cares, right? Now, one truth about that is that when you're under pressure, you're likely to regress. When you're feeling good, you're likely to progress, and then you've got a base um, uh, stage that you're operating from most of the time, but it doesn't matter what it is. This isn't a question of going, ah, stage five mindset, send him to management. We're not doing that, right? What we actually, what we actually, want, to f what we actually want to find is the edge, is the developmental edge of somebody's psychological capability. And we can do that with a really simple technique that Bob Keegan has given us that's been practiced in the field for a couple of decades, which he calls immunity to change. Now, the idea behind this is that we all have our stated goals, right? to do more exercise. Mine for years was to lose a bit of weight, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't do it. I didn't do it for years and years and years. I, didn't, I really meant it though, I really meant it. So what Bob says, what Keegan says, is that we all have hidden commitments to other things. So I'll, I'll tell you another of my um, issues, uh, is that I am a little bit more wedded to control than I would like to be. I am, I come from, <laughs> I come from an operational background and I'm not apologizing, I just am and I'm working on it, right? Now, if I stop, so if that's my goal, to, to, to let other people have control, problem with that statement, more than I do currently, no good asking me, well, what are the, what are the hidden commitments, John, that stop you doing that? That's too big a leap, right? I don't know. So what, what Keegan asks you to do instead is to think, of, well, what are you doing instead of letting other people have control, right? And one of the things I might be doing is talking too much. Does that sound right, Matt? Yeah, right. I might talk too much. Now, 
why, why might I be talking too much? Well, so the question that we ask ourselves is, we were in meetings and didn't talk so much. And the answer, when I asked myself this question, was, well, oh, I actually feel a bit nervous because if I'm not talking a lot, well, other people won't know what to do, right? And what's going to happen then? Well, they're going to... I'm being recorded. They're going to mess things up, right? So what... You've got to, got to get it out. Yeah. That's the stage four mindset speaking. Yeah, correct. You're right, you have. So there's a big assumption underpinning all of this, isn't there? You can see it coming, right? The reason I want to be controlling is because I think I'm better than everybody else. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. But that's the cold, hard truth, right? At least to some degree. So we start to unlock these hidden commitments, that's right? Where? Self-awareness is massive. Now, some people will not go here in these conversations. They're just not going there. It's too uncomfortable. But a lot of people in our organization will. So we've done some remarkable things lately. Our management team have done some things that I think are remarkable lately. We've, we've pretty much thrown away objectives, all right? I mean, we haven't actually, but no longer are they decided at the top that align with strategy and get rolled down. That view of objectives, gone. What the management team have realized is that actually if we just ask the people what they want to get involved with, probably it'll line up to our strategy some way. And we can adjust the way we want to get to our strategy based on what people are committed to doing. That's a radical, radical shift for chief operating officers who make their living out of controlling uh, organizations. Right? Um, another example is, oh, we've dropped uh, targets around utilization time for consultants. They no longer paid their bonus based on those targets, right? Yeah, exactly, right. Now, our COO has a reputation of being very risk averse, very operational, very controlling. And that's what he's doing after we've unlocked some of the hidden commitments, right? So the change you start to see is quite rapid. Right, talking too much. Um, the other thing. <laughs> Well, there is an answer to that. There is an answer to that, um, uh, and we can find it. Um, so the third thing that we're doing is creating a counterculture. We're not creating a counterculture in the side in a WeWork office over there that we call an innovation hub. We're doing it at the very heart of the business. So Matt and I and John Kern, who I mentioned earlier, we've essentially been hired to upset the apple cart, to challenge, yes, revolutionaries, no, evolutionaries, right? We're just here to challenge ideas, but obviously in a constructive way to get things done. So this counterculture is the DDE, right? It is the deliberately developmental environment. And the first thing it has to be is a safe space, right? You can come into this space, do what you like in this space. You've got to solve a complex problem. You've got to do it in the right way in which you should expect to be challenged. You should expect to challenge us we should, we should expect to be, we, sh we can say the unsayable in here. We can't out there, we know that, right? And as we're creating a bit of momentum, more people are going, this actually looks quite interesting. We're creating pull. We're not telling people what to do. They are coming to join us. The long tail is huge and it takes forever. The early adopters are coming in. It's growing. We're developing more and more momentum. And this means that we're starting to create an environment in which a, a very operational company, don't record that, don't say it out loud, adaptivist is very operationally orientated for various reasons, starts to become innovative. We start to recognize um, that we can get good ideas from the edge, that we can bridge those into the operational core of the business, that we need to have entrepreneurs acting as those bridge, crazy scientists in the lab blowing things up, passing stuff into the operational core when it's ready so they can scale it. That all comes from creating a counterculture. So they're the tools that we're using, maybe things that you could take into your own organizations and try just in little small safe experiments. You would actually don't even need permission to do them half the time because you'll just get a good outcome and people will be happy, right? Um, Black Ops for business. There we go. Um, so there you go. That, that's what happens when you get an agile mindset. So um, there we go. Thank you. Are you on that one? Oh, no, I'm not on that one. I wouldn't, put, I, would, I wouldn't put a picture of me up there. You've seen what pictures of me look like at the beginning, right? <laughs> Anybody got any questions for John? Can I take questions? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I can take some questions. Yeah, of course. Sorry. You said create a safe space. Yeah. What does that actually mean? 
What it means is that we need to sit down with our managers and say, when things go wrong, don't give people a bollocking. I'll tell you, I tell you what we do, right? I'll tell you, uh, a real example the other day, um, we've set up something called, called an action learning group, which is the manifestation of this safe space. They've got a complex problem, they've drawn a group together, okay? Now, the person that's leading that group is quite senior. She reports to the head of consulting or professional services, whatever he's called. A situation arose the other day when she felt that he had given her a bollocking, right? Now, they didn't talk to each other about this, okay? So I talked to one of them, said, uh, they told me you got a bollocking. I spoke to the other, said, this person feels like they got a bollocking. That's not what you meant, is it? No. So we drew them together and we had a conversation about it, right? That's a safe space. Instead of walking away, she actually rolled that bollocking downhill, by the way, because she's very operational. Creating a space in which we can have that conversation and it proved to be good, that's a safe space. Yay. Revolutionary, isn't it, brother? Any other questions? Anything else for, for John? Uh, thank you for listening to me. If you want to find me, I'm on LinkedIn or at Adaptivist. Um, feel free. Love to talk. Thank you. <laughs>